Hi, everyone, and welcome to part two of our Forecasting Masterclass Roundtable Series. We previously covered best practices that you can use to achieve 95% forecast accuracy. In this session, we'll cover the forecast processes, cadence, and schedule that lands you within 5% of your forecast. We'll also go over how to align these processes with your team's current practices and how to successfully build your forecasting function. We have a great panel of forecasting revenue experts with us today. They are Elise Iovino. She's currently the VP of Global Sales Operations at Sitecore, previously running business strategy operations at Riverbed Technologies. Eric Tuscher joins us from Pluralsight, where he's a VP of Revenue, Strategy, and Operations. In addition to building their forecasting process from the ground up, Eric leads the Global Strategy and Operations team that sits across marketing, sales, and success. We also have Brandon Bussey. He is the VP of Revenue Operations at Lucid, whereas he, he is a Boost Up customer and user. Formerly of Qualtrics and Amazon, Brandon brings over 10 years of industry experience with expertise in full go-to-market strategy, data-driven decision-making, and scalable processes. I'm Ruth France, Head of Customer Success here at Boost Up. Let's dive in. So we know that to maximize accuracy, you must have a bulletproof forecasting process. You must ensure that your forecast occurs on a set timeline and that you stick to the schedule no matter what. But over the years, and especially recently, Forecasting has become increasingly complex. We're constantly figuring out how to include new business types, sales cycles, and stages into the forecast. We try to find new metrics and gain insight at different levels. This has caused a massive evolution in the way that forecasting is done, so much so that it's become a primary function of revenue operations and sales operations. With that, let's get into some of the processes that can help us achieve a more accurate forecast. I'd love to hear from our panel. Elise, why don't you start us off? Great thing. Um, I'm just pulling up these uh, slides, but essentially, um, I uh, want to talk about some of the high growth um, challenges that come with forecasting. Um, and actually, Ruth, is there a way that, sorry, I'm new to Chromecast or this, this type of crowdcast. Is there a way to see the slides you're sharing? Ooh, that is a great question. But I can, I don't know. Myself. I'm sorry about that. Oh, am I not sharing my screen? Oh, goodness. That was my fault. Oh, no worries. That's what happened there, Elise. I am so sorry. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Um, so for me, like I'm pretty new to Psychor. This is me in my second month. And for me, like I'm kind of coming into an environment that is super, super high growth. So for those of you out there who, um, are in a high growth company. Um, some of the forecasting challenges that are definitely present um, for one is basically that your company growth uh, is, is growing faster than your process, right? So a lot of companies, as they start growing, your process starts to mature, but there does come a point where you can see just massive growth within um, one, two years, and it takes some time to get that, um, that process mature. And so that could be a challenge for those who are just maybe doing, you know, manual roll ups, using Excel, right? Like it takes time to build out those processes and not just for your forecasting processes, but also for the processes that are supporting sales, right? So legal, order management, um, you know, product management, all of these other functions, processes flow in and impact sales and the fork and the accuracy of your forecasting, right? So knowing, um, uh, having the other supporting functions um, improve their efficiency and their processes um, impacts your sales cycle time, right? And the ability for you um, to close the deals um, in the timeline that you think you'll close. And so, again, it's just more focusing on not only your forecasting process, but how do the other functions process fit into that? And that could be a, a big challenge. Um, and then it really just also will come down to capacity, right? So growing companies, they can have, um, they are trying to hit their growth goals as well as a lot of the times um, bottom line EBITDA goals too, right? And so you might be having extreme sales growth, but the capacity for you guys to work on those process improvements versus just the day-to-day, -day, you know, fighting, um, fighting for the number, um, it does pose challenges. Um, also, especially in high growth, you can have basically different sales cycles and, and process to manage and predict, right? So for example, um, if you're going uh, a new logo in a company like mine, right, where we uh, do most of our deals direct, 
um, takes a lot longer and has a different sales cycle time versus an existing customer that already might have an MSA where they can just add on upsells, cross sell orders. And so being able to start managing um, the different sales cycles time within your forecast process and understand how that impacts your accuracy um, is super huge. Um, that being said, additionally, um, inorganic growth is, is big. So, you know, Sitecore, we just did announce three acquisitions in a really short period of time. And you have uh, um, uh, acquired companies that you're trying to put into your forecast and integrate, you know, pretty much for us, like within a week or two of announcement, we're trying to get those numbers into our forecast process. And again, these um, companies can have completely different types of sales cycle times, different ways of selling, different velocities. And so for, for everyone to be able to start, um, to be able to manage those different uh, types of, of uh, deals um, and have that, um, and have a process that, process that feeds into your forecast is super huge. And again, it, it can bring a lot of complexity, right, in a very short period of time. Um, yeah. a, Additionally, like that also, um, if you want to go back one slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Elise. Oh, no worries. Um, again, as you start expanding and growing, you may put uh, different go-to-market strategies in place. So you may want to start penetrating other customer segments. So for example, if you're going up market, you might see longer sales cycle times, right? With these larger enterprise or, or huge companies. But that being said, maybe you are an enterprise um, focused company and you want to start going down market and have to do more high velocity sales right so again like different sales cycle times different deal time different go to market um, which all impacts the accuracy and can bring complexity and challenges and that being additionally new geographies as well right um, for us like different geos um, brings definitely um, complexity in terms of um, just trying to have a standardization in terms of speaking the same language right so enablement here is key in terms of making sure that each of the different regions um they when you talk about best case or you talk about a commit deal are you talking about the different sales stages are we all speaking the same language and is the numbers that you're pulling in from the different geographies really meaning the same thing and that's where you can start seeing swings where you're not necessarily getting all the commit deals and commit or all the best case and best case and you're not necessarily speaking the same language and have a consistent um, forecast. Um, so that's part of those challenges. Um, and then again, like sales ramp and capacity planning, right? Like as you're growing, you're bringing on a ton of new reps in a short period of time and you're trying to build out your capacity model and your go-to-market planning for the next year and try to predict uh, the different budgets um, and how your sales are going to ramp and what your different linearity per your quarter should be. And so knowing that true sales ramp, especially in a high growth period, is definitely a challenge, right? That could impact the accuracy of your forecasting uh, just from the beginning of the year, right? And so that's um, so those are some key challenges for me. I definitely am um, focusing on right now being new here, but I'm sure a lot of you out there um, have felt those same challenges in high growth. And so if you want to go to the next slide, yeah. um, we'll talk about some of the tips of what I'm trying to work through now in terms of those challenges. So for me, it's really about focus, right? Here, like growth is super high, but, you know, we don't have a ton of capacity and resources um, to be able to achieve everything we want to do in a short period of time, right? So defining the areas of focus are key. And for me, when I'm looking to figure out where I want to focus on, I'm looking for the key risk areas. I'm going back, I'm looking and seeing where have we been off the most? What are the areas of our forecasting and the company that have the most risk? Um, and then diving into those processes and figuring out, okay, how can I move the needle on these high risk areas um, that have the biggest material impact um, to the accuracy of the forecast and focusing on those? Um, for me also, I'm trying to drive standardization across uh, the sales teams, again, the geo sales teams and the sales operations team. So really focusing on making sure we are speaking the same language, um, um, making sure that what is flowing into the forecast is truly um, what um, is truly the definitions that we've done and enablement is super key there. Um, and we're working really closely with our sales enablement team to make sure that in the beginning of the year, we actually have a July 1st uh, um, start to the year, um, that enablement on the new sales processes is really key. 
Um, I can't see the two bottom um, bullets, but if you want to oh, read those out to me, I should have them. Yeah, memory. you've got deal inspection and prioritizing a foundational data process. Perfect. So, um, so for me, deal inspection is one of the ways, like when in doubt, like inspect deals, right? And we definitely right now have a cadence where at least on, um, well, on a weekly basis, we're well, we're definitely inspecting like the top deals in commit forecast and upside, um, even up to the CEO level, right? So we do a lot of deal inspection of the largest deals. Um, and we have cadences where we'll even go through during the core, like complete scrubs of the pipeline, even in the next quarter pipeline, just to make sure we truly understand where the deals are. Um, so if you, when in doubt, like you definitely deal inspection will improve your forecast accuracy. Um, but again, as you start growing and your transaction volume gets higher, that's where like you don't ne you aren't necessarily able to inspect, you know, all of the deals that will materially make up your forecast. Um, and so that's where like my last point is if you do have low resources in terms of building out some of these processes, for me, like foundationally prioritizing the data processes um, is super huge and data hygiene. And a lot of the time those kind of are not like, you know, the sexiest processes, but all of the other, um, all of the other processes that you, that you build upon those is what will get you that better accuracy, right? So making sure that you're having all of your data hygiene in terms of even like the, um, marketing leads to the opportunity can help you really track like again those sales cycle times for the different types of sales you have the different segments and that will help um in general be able to put you know more sophisticated uh tools on top of that that can even be like predictive ai that will really help give you another um point of view from a data standpoint of the um your forecast yeah, that's great. You talked a lot about different teams, um, new logo, expansion, renewal. When you're looking at improving forecast accuracy, who have you found necessary to be involved in either creating the process, executing on the process, giving feedback on the process? Absolutely. I mean, really for me, like forecasting and a lot of sales process is super um, cross-functional, right? Obviously, like working with marketing um, for how we're going to penetrate and build pipeline on the different segments and understanding conversion rate um, is super key. Um, obviously, for me, like I don't run necessarily the sales systems and BI teams, but obviously hand in hand with that team, right, that is going to um, help put those processes in place. Um, also, like obviously IT for us um, is huge. Um, and again, like for me, the way that you can work in terms of building out these processes is is really getting cross-functional buy-in and prioritization because again especially in a high growth area there's a ton of different projects with lower resources so being able to again like find the material areas of the business that is going to move the needle the most can really help you like gain that championship from all the different functions um to be able to um align and prioritize the major areas um, for the company. Awesome. Brandon or Eric, would you add anything to that in terms of who you want to include in that um, process as you're building out? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, obviously the, the sales uh, or, or broader revenue organization is critical. I think, um, you know, the, the focus uh, which is the first bullet here is probably a key one because I think often it's easy to go to everyone and ask everyone mm -hmm. for input and especially or have a ha have a, a a less mature process. Everyone's going to have input and and really you need to be focused on where the most important inputs into that process and and focusing on those. Um, and so you know t working with senior sales leaders. Uh, is probably more useful than working with you know uh, a, a, a rep who, who may have to or maybe the first time they're forecasting in sort of this environment um and so i think you know figuring out who within the revenue organization um to get feedback on and to help sort of build that process is really critical and then you know realizing that you you need to have a strong it function data function uh bi to then support the the data capture, the visualization, and all of the work and sort of the magic that goes that goes into uh, getting a, a getting a, a forecast and then being able to do something with it. 
Yeah, and the only thing I'd add is it, it really just depends on kind of your emotion, your process on who those key stakeholders are. I agree 100% with Eric that I think too many people fail by bringing in every single person that could have some nuanced impact on the forecast in this first round. Um, but it may be different from different organizations, right? We have a very um, unassisted motion. So our growth team, it's really important to have their voice in our forecast process because a lot of what we're you know, building our pipeline is driven by kind of upscale or upstream impacts of them. So having yeah. them in our model is really important. Whereas for traditional B2B companies, probably not, not that impactful. So understanding who the key stakeholders and influencers who can actually make decisions um, and, and change those inputs are the ones that I'd focus on. Yeah, that's great advice. We definitely see it boost up. It, it really comes down to a couple of different people that end up being our stakeholders building out forecasts. And then as soon as we get everyone into the tool, everyone's got inputs and it's a matter of prioritizing those inputs uh, into the company's business priorities. So fully understand that there. Eric, we'd love hey. to hear from you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Ruth, just one more comment that I think um, you just you just touched on that I think is actually as you as you think about forecast and you have to ask yourself and, and the and the company why are we doing this? What's the value or outcome that we want to drive with uh, improved forecast accuracy? Um, you know, for us, uh, when I joined, uh, we didn't have a, a really robust forecast process. Um, you know, over time we built that out, and and the main use case was uh, twofold: one, uh, to so we could be a public company, but two, that we could. Uh, accurately understand what's going to happen and therefore have a CFO that was actually willing to spend more money on a, from a go-to-market perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, um, you know, if, if the outcomes are different that you're looking to you actually have a different forecast process or a less robust forecast process. Um, and so I think that's just something else to think about is like, what is the outcome that, that the forecast process will drive and what does it need to create? And that may help design what that process looks like. That's a great point. And I will let you kind of jump into what you've got. Yeah, awesome. So uh, um, here we can just uh, we can just flip through them uh, really quickly. Uh, I've been at Pluralsight, um, just context here, uh, for about four and a half years. Um, and before that was in, in management consulting. Um, so let's ju let's jump to the next slide here, it, it, and I wanted to um, maybe ground people in what I see as uh, critical and can't start. You can't even build a forecast process unless you have this stuff happening. Um, it, you know, you can you can have a beautiful process, but if you don't have a uh, you know clean data. It, it doesn't matter what process you you run that that dirty data through. You're not going to get an accurate. So to me, that number number one is define sales process. You know, if you're in stage one or stage five, what does that mean? Um, what what are the entry and exit criteria for each of the stages? Is there consistency within your sales organization around having deals at specific um, uh, sales stages? And once you start having that, you can start understanding win rates at this stage. What what are the conversion rates, the pass through conversion rates uh, across the different um, uh, stages? So that's that's point number one. Point number two on data quality is you know if you're trying to forecast for this quarter for next quarter, uh, really really hard to understand which opportunities are should be included or shouldn't be included if the close dates are wrong quarter if it's hey that's a million dollar deal versus actually it's a five hundred thousand dollar deal um you you have to have the the rigor around the the really critical crm data um that uh is easy to i think overlook or or not have sort of up to date um the third piece is define forecast roles and parameters so what do i what do i mean by that um what i mean is you have to understand it for each uh, individual rep, for for a first line leader, uh, for a VP, for an SVP. What is the role that they're playing in the forecast? Um, and uh, addition to that, you know, we have different. We often have stages, but we also have forecast categories. Um, and you know, so we use commit, expected, best case. What does that mean? What what is expected? What is commit? What is what is best case? 
and defining all of those things so that it's clear and then enabling on it is is critical. And then the last thing is, um, and at least mentioned this, deal reviews and, and inspection. Um, if you have a bunch of pipeline that is not being inspected on a regular basis, my guess is, uh, it sort of goes back to my first point, you won't have good quality data and therefore you won't be able to forecast. And so to me, those four things, like if you if you don't have those four or they're not uh, pretty robust, like start there because all, all you talk about won't be useful. It won't generate a, a good outcome from a forecast perspective. Um, so let's maybe jump to the next slide here. So um, in terms of where to start and, and how to start, um, the thing I would say first is start simple. It, it is really easy for us uh, in the roles that we that we play to to want to add a lot of complexity. There's so much nuance to forecasting. Um, at least talked about some of that, like geo and um, different segments and uh, different. They, they you, you could forecast by channel and by geo, and and all of that's awesome. And you'll never get the thing off the, this process off the ground unless you start really simple. And what I would say is it, it's it's a way for you to to start get, gaining some traction, and then you can add complexity as you go. And I think we've um, you know we've been able to adopt something similar, where it was a process to begin with, and we've been able to beef it up over time. And and I think. Um, it's easier to, to gain momentum and see progress and have people understand what you're trying to accomplish. And you, you'll get more people to, to align to that. Um, th the second bullet here uh, is, is not in any particular order here, but the it, it is so critical that everyone buys into the process. Um, at Pluralsight, we forecast on a weekly basis. So we forecast what the current quarter uh, will end at. And, and then towards the end of the quarter, we actually start forecasting the next quarter as well. And um, uh, if there is not buy-in at a senior level, uh, my guess is you may start this process and build out the process and it may work for a month or two. But then when it starts to get hard and things get busy and there's integrations or there's other things that are happening, you will likely start uh, seeing drop off from uh, in your in your forecast process. There has to be from all the senior revenue leaders, the executive team that this is one of, if not the most important exercise on a weekly basis and have commitment to that. And, and then those people will lead their teams. Uh, to that as well. Um, third bullet here um, that we uh, have done at Pluralsight, and I think it's it's been useful for us, which is, you know, we, we talk a lot about building forecast models for the sales team to run, and uh, and that's very useful. And what I would say is it's also useful to have uh, your own forecast. And, and the reason why is you can start to triangulate where there's issues or, or where you actually see differences. And I think it's helped uh, us have kind of two separate perspectives on what the model or what, what, what the forecast uh, is likely to be, given that we can look at the sort of bottoms up build from the sales side and maybe a tops down uh, uh, data science uh, model or ensemble model um, in, in, ter in terms of, uh, you know, not, not really using this, the sales driven uh, methodology. Um, and then maybe the last thing here is something uh, that's, an, I, I would say not a must have, but a nice to have, which is um, being able to track your forecast and, and who is calling what at what point in the quarter can allow you to understand who's uh, who's just a hedger and will always hedge. And, and so you can either coach them not to hedge or you can actually account for them always hedging or vice versa. There's someone that's always super aggressive and, um, and, and isn't quite, uh, you know, it can't quite because they, they're, they're optimistic. They think every deal is going to close. It, it's, it's helpful to sort of be able to tune those things. And, and as long as you're capturing that data on a weekly or monthly basis, I think it'll it's useful to be able to go back and um, 
and, and reference that in the future. Maybe the, the let's jump to the next slide here. Um, and this is a, a little bit illustrative. Well, not a little bit, it is illustrative. Um, I think there's, uh, there's um, you know, you could spend a lot of time forecasting, a lot of time. Um, and, and you think about big organizations and you have multiple lay layers of, of reps and then leadership. And, you know, there is a lot of time on a weekly basis that's spent on forecasting. And the, the, the point of, of this chart here, where you have time and effort on the X axis and then your accurate Y axis is at some point there's a break, right? Where it's, uh, you know, incremental time and effort doesn't actually get you that much more forecast accuracy. And I don't know where that, like what that looks like specifically or, or, or where it needs to be for, for any given company. But I, but I think it's worth um, spending some time thinking about how accurately really need this to be. You know, if you're, if you're a, a series A company that um, uh, is uh, sort of needs to be plus or minus 30% and, and you know, funding keeps going, you know, that's probably all, all the time you need to spend on forecasting. If you're a public company and, and order, um, you know, bookings will determine stock price, it, it probably needs to be within 5%, right? And, and so I think um, j just spending a little bit of time thinking about where are you and, and how much time can you spend, um, I, I think will we'll, uh, create dividends for you. Um, one of the things here that we've tried to do, uh, and there's always more that we could go do, is to try and automate as much as you can. Like my goal uh, as a as a ops leader is to really minimize the amount of time people have to spend forecasting. Like they they are going to generate more value for the, if they're spending time with customers, and so. I want to do as much as I can to, to create, you know, one pane of glass, so to speak, for them to be able to just kind of see everything that uh, they need in order to, to create an accurate forecast, do the forecast, and then get back to customers. And I think often we, we uh, um, easy to, to, to add lots of requirements, add lots of complexity, and, and have them spend way more time forecasting than, than maybe um, is, is useful. And then the last thing uh, is just, Look, we, um, it's easy to set a process and then let it run and forget about it. One of the things that is useful is going back periodically and saying, what's working, what's not working, and, uh, and, and tweaking it over time. Um, and uh, hopefully that both improves the forecast and reduces the amount of time that's actually, that it actually takes to, to generate a forecast. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, one of the things that came to mind for me is you were talking a lot about layering on complexities, starting simple, um, and also reviewing and optimizing, which is super important. But what are some signals either from your team or the sales team that make you go, okay, we're ready to add on more complexity, or maybe we need to scale this back? Yeah, it, when we start, uh, when we actually start feeling complacent and say, hey, I, th there's actually not a lot that I need to do uh, from a fork to, to either generate the forecast. Um, uh, to me, that says it's, there's probably time for us to actually start thinking about what are the, what, what are the next add to the model. Um, in, in terms of when have we gone too far? I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's feedback from the sales team, uh, frankly. And I think you, you gotta, you gotta balance that one and understand, you know, where's the feedback coming from? Is it a, you know, we, we made the change at end of quarter. And so it's a, it's a point problem right now, but once we move into the new quarter, they'll find about it. Um, is it just something new? So I think it's a little bit of sensing, like how is our team feeling about the process? And if we're, if we're steady state, we can add more. If the sales team is giving us feedback to say, this is too much, you know, what well, we, we can, we can pull back. Um, I think, you know, there, there is also nothing to do from a forecasting process perspective that we aren't working hand in hand with those senior sales leaders on. And so we work with them and, and, and they're the ones that help sort of build out that forecast process or changes to that forecast process. 
and they will they will provide the feedback then before we even roll it out that hey this is going to be too complex too much right now oh you know hey let, let let's let's move ahead with it yeah no brandon or elise what are some signals from your teams and maybe it's something super similar but in your past what are some signals where you've said okay we need to kind of roll this back or, or continue pushing forward with more complexity yeah i mean for me like one of the key metrics that i think actually just helps in general with forecast accuracy is tracking linearity it's like one of our biggest thing it comes from the top and so for me like in terms of when we need to really start diving in looking at where we need to, um, you know, add to the process to get more understanding of the underlying um, uh, areas that could be leading towards us um, being accurate is linearity, right? And so if we start getting way off on linearity or we miss pretty big, like that's where we're kind of deep diving and figuring out what was it that we've missed, especially if we consistently miss, um, we start digging into, again, what's driving us to miss some of these targets, um, what are the areas and how can we get better and then start building it out. But to um, Eric's point with the lens of, we can't have the rep spend more time forecasting than selling, right? So there has to be that balance of uh, how much process, especially again, when you're growing, you may not have as much of the sophisticated tools in place that makes it easy. So you have to find a way to balance out what you're adding to the sales reps plate, but then also leverage sales ops, right? And so um, for us, it's also kind of trying to find that balance in the middle of how much my team supports sales in terms of um, their opportunity management, their forecasting process versus the sales teams and sales leaders. Um, but yeah, for us, like I think linearity is one of those key things that we track pretty regularly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just just adding to that, I'd say look, really looking at the data, like what is the what is the adherence to your current process, right? If you have forecast category and you just rolled that out, some new stages, and if all of a sudden you tell, your rep, you can click, quickly see throughout the data that the reps or the managers are not using it. And so that's an early signal that, hey, we either need to reinforce this or you know deep dive into why that's not being used. Maybe it's not the right process. Maybe it's too complicated. They're not ready for it, et cetera. So that's generally where you need to dial back in addition to the qualitative feedback is just looking at the data and how um, the the data is kind of, sh is it consistent? Is it showing you some sort of pattern? If the answer is no, then you you need to either dial it back, revisit it, um, do something there. Um, secondly, I would say on when to get more sophisticated or when to add more, I think it really steps back. For me, I step back and be like, at the end of every quarter, and we all know this, you get asked, well, you were 5%, even if you're within 5%, they're gonna ask, well, why were you 5% over? Why were you 5% under? And if you can't answer that, like you've got to be able to build that into your process and be and move to the next iteration of your forecast because that's super critical. That's where I've found most of the learning actually comes. It's not in building the process and doing all the pre-work. It's after we've completed a quarter and we missed or made it or exceeded it that we do the deep dive and understand, oh, well, we missed because X, Y, and Z. And if your process doesn't allow you to be able to see that data, you're definitely, um, or to the level of granularity, that's a great signal to add some additional layers and be able to have those kind of conversations. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And Brandon, I'd love to kind of jump into what you've brought to us today. Cool. Um, we could probably skip through this. Just a quick introduction to Lucid as a company. Uh, predominantly, we have two, we have three kind of core products, but two that I think is important to highlight because I think it impacts the way in which we forecast. Um, we are a product led growth company, so we have a really strong underpinning kind of self-serve model. And then we have a kind of enterprise selling motion on top of that. So very much land and expand. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, a um, couple of things I wanted to highlight, and I think they kind of align with most of what people have said, but um, some of the essential elements I found in a great sales forecast is first consistency, right? Um, having spent a lot my whole career in kind of analytics, um, it's really hard to build predictive models when your historical data is just like totally different neurotic behaviors, right? So consistency is really important. So being very deliberate with your peers in sales enablement and sales leadership, when you're thinking through your sales stages, your forecast categories, whatever it is, making sure you're intentional and not every quarter changing it because it's really hard to predict if your sales motion and sales process is changing every quarter. Um, it can actually, and this is maybe a little 
something I don't recommend, but a consistent process can actually make up for inefficiencies in, you know, Salesforce hygiene, right? As long as they're inconsistently do or consistently being inaccurate, you can actually predict that relatively well. Like I said, I don't recommend that, but consistency is super important. Um, and, and it should be taken. And that's where I think you need to partner as an ops person, partner really closely with your sales enablement and all those types of peers, because this is a downstream impact of, hey, we want to change our sales process again. You can say, well, it's going to massively impact our abil ability to predict and forecast revenue um, if we do this. Or should we you know, take a moment, pause, push it out and, and ensure that we have a bit more consistency? Second, I would say transparent. Um, one of the things I think we've seen a lot is we, we literally had an all hands uh, last week and our SVP of sales <clears throat> put up some metrics, but one of them was um, number of open opportunities set to close this quarter on a weekend, right? Like literally just pulled the number of ops where the close date was on a weekend. And, I, and it was pretty high. And I guarantee you every single sales rep immediately went through their pipeline and immediately like looked for all of those and moved them off, which is great. And that's exactly the intent. Um, but I use that as an example because too often we we forecast we have this whole process in this bubble where it's like the vps doing it all independent and then guess what your sales reps on the front line actually have no idea what you're calling as an organization hey we just called like 120 percent of our number let's all cheer let's go really rally around that but instead it just kind of stays in this behind these locked doors and so by being transparent throughout the sales floor really kind of is a great behavior change mechanism of saying hey Here's what we're calling as a total program. Um, here's some of the things that we're focusing on. This is how we're getting to that number. Um, we look at you know the pipeline and the number of deals set to close and some of those types of things. Oh, that is why. And then the reps say that is why my manager is always harping on me to not have a close date on the very last day of the quarter because that's not realistic. Um, so transparent, um, adaptable. I think <clears throat> too often we take a one size fits all approach, or I see people come from their previous company and say, well, this is what I did. And so I'm going to introduce it here. Um, I, I, it's extra um, evident for us at Lucid. We have a very, with this product led growth model, it's a very different process, right? For example, if we do just the normal, like commit best case, we have a big transactional engine um, underneath kind of our larger deals. And we'll miss that if we're just doing best case and commit, or if I force that on every single deal, you've now got reps like, moving deals that are like $500, $1,000 that are gonna close. It takes them more time to actually fill out the forecast information than it does to actually close it and, and, and um, move it to closed one. So, um, and looking at the different segments within your business, it doesn't always end up being one size fits all. Like I think, uh, <clears throat> I can't remember which, which panelist talked about, you know, the new logo versus expansion, the taking a single forecast methodology for both of those, a lot of times this doesn't work. Now you can go too far to an extreme to where you have like hyper specialized forecast. That's obviously too far. Um, but make sure that you're including elements um, that really adapt to that specific sales motion. Um, okay, and then last row, uh, the making sure it's robust. And and I liked Eric's kind of kind of the I like the crawl walk run methodology or kind of ideology of like, take it slow, don't necessarily go from zero to 100, but don't too many companies, um, I think fault by having one singular way of forecasting. It's like, you have your Monday sales manager call, they call it and that's it and you just walk away and that's your forecast, right? You should have multiple models. I have a background in finance and fp &A, and so we had so many models. Um, I remember one of my, so I, I worked at Amazon, I worked in our central finance um, organization. And one of my roles there was we took all the data from, we took a bunch of kind of data we'd collect from all of our different business units. And we ran an independent forecast. We ran it through some statistical models and whatnot. And then we would have, um, we'd then compare that to the bottoms up model that all these finance depart departments were building. And I remember one specific instance, we. Uh, we saw a major variance between our model and the China retail mo team's model, right? And we're so it ended up driving a really powerful conversation where we said, look, we're way higher than you. They said, well, what you're not taking into account is there's some new tax laws 
um, like sales tax laws, similar to like VAT tax taking effect in China. And therefore it's going to have this imp implication to our, um, you know, bottoms up forecast, right. And our, our sales there. Um, well, through that conversation, we were actually able to um, determine and by look, but then they saw our model and they're like, Ooh, we didn't think it was going to be like a, and I'm making up this number, like a 20% hit. We thought it was more like 10%. And if you were predicting without this, we would have been here. They ended up raising their number as well. And so there's power in taking like multiple approaches to getting to your forecast, because not only does it provide additional insight, but like there's assumptions. We know that every single process has assumptions, has potential risks and inaccuracies. So by taking multiple approaches, it really helps you triangulate your number. Um, and so I think that's, you know, super, super powerful. Um, so these are kind of four, I think, elements that really help you um, have a really great sales forecast. Next slide. Yeah. And so then the last, just a couple of pitfalls that I've seen over the years that I think is good for people to avoid. One, and it's kind of dovetails into the last uh, comment there, but thinking the forecast as a singular process, right? Forecasts, it's so funny when I hear people say, we need to forecast. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Does that mean your quarterly rolled up call? Does that mean your deal? Like, is this deal going to close? Does that mean um, your financial forecast? Like there's so many different iterations of the forecast. You need to think about all of those different aspects and how they all influence each other. And so making sure you're thinking about that way. Second, I think this was kind of reiterated um, or was iterated earlier by Eric, but don't overdo it. Start simple, right? The crawl, walk, run. Start with something that's really important. Start. I like to start backwards, for example. Start at um, kind of with the end in mind. I think you know, Eric, <clears throat> you you had you had mentioned um, the why. Like, why are you forecasting, right? And one of the reasons is to drive predictability and to understand like where you were off. And so, making sure by starting there and working backwards, like don't build a process that at the end of the day, which we've probably all done, and I don't, I've made this mistake where you've got this great you know forecast model, and then you um, have your number, the actuals come in and immediately your CEO, your SVP of sales says, why did we miss? And you're like, uh, my model doesn't really help me understand. That. Um, and so, but starting with the end in mind and starting very simply, I think is really critical. Um, and then third, I would say mismanaged expectations, right? Um, and one of the things I highlight here is too often, you know, we have a background, most of us in like analytics operations, our sales leaders, that's not their strength. And I don't know that we necessarily want it to be like, I don't want my sales managers like trying to do like in-depth forecasting and data analytics, right? Like that's why we're here. So um, too often, I think we say like, here's some data and go figure out what your forecast is when we should provide the tools and the assets to help them come up with their forecast call. Um, and so always remembering like, and not setting expectations that our sales leaders are supposed to be like analysts, I think is really critical. And that's one of the areas I'd call out. Um, and then last but not least, not thinking of implications, right? Um, I, I think many of us have seen either publicly traded companies or companies that are, you know, getting close to it, or at least have, you know, mature kind of revenue recognition processes. And so the one thing I would encourage most companies, even if you're a really small series A company, a little thought now um, into your processes goes a long way. It's much harder to change a process once it's been ingrained in reps' minds, ingrained in the sales leaders' minds. And guess what? It really wouldn't have made a difference if you had launched it, you know, in day one versus, you know, minus 90 days from an IPO kind of a thing. So really just take a little bit of um, forethought into, okay, how would this look in a publicly traded com company where we have rev rec implications? Um, and so spending a few minutes thinking through that will give you so much, such a head start um, as opposed to uh, now than trying to correct for it later. So those are a couple, I think, highlights that uh, I've kind of found as thinking about kind of some of these sales processes that go into a successful forecast. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, a lot of you have talked about processes to get you to this accurate forecast. And Brandon, I would love to hear from you being a boost up customer, thinking about what you looked at and, and what you weighed when looking at a tool and kind of thinking about these pitfalls to avoid and, and the things, uh, adaptability and all of those things. What, what were some of your decision criteria around that? Yeah, as we've been looking to kind of solve some of these problems with tools, and we're still, you know, I think early on and rolling 
some of these things out. But one of the things I want to give to our leaders is, I mean, talking about that kind of third box there is giving the tools that managers can um, have to be able to understand where is their risk in my pipeline, right? Where and we talked about deal inspection, being able to quickly find, oh, hey, this deal has massive risk to it. The rep is calling that they're going to like, this is a you know six figure deal that they're saying is going to close in two weeks, but they haven't talked to the person in three weeks, right? Like, so quickly, you know, surfacing where they have risks in their in their process, I think is really good because the managers, the leaders can actually jump in at that point and when they can actually have an influence on closing the deal as opposed to wait, the close date came and passed, we lost the deal, it's too late, right? Um, and so that's been a, hu a huge piece there. And um, I, I think Eric talked a lot about this of kind of being able to, I don't wanna say identify the sandbaggers, but you can see those trends of where people are calling relative to where they close and just having it all in kind of one place, I think just really enables everyone to see it. And it's not like some secret report that I have that says, okay, you know, Johnny over here, every every quarter is forecasting 30% below what he ends up hitting. Like Johnny's gonna see that, right? When he looks at his quarters and where he's forecasting versus it comes in. So it kind of almost helps them self-train and self-correct. Um, so those are a couple of areas that, you know, we're excited to to really push out to the sales team and was huge as, as we thought through and evaluated various tools. Yeah. And I, I think that transparency is huge. That drive of the behavior that you want to drive. Um, so yeah. Eric and Elise, uh, same question to you, kind of what is some of your decision criteria when you're looking at tools for this process, whether you decide, listen, we're going to go with a spreadsheet right now or no, we need a, a really accurate tool beyond Salesforce. I'll go for it. Um, you know, it, for us, again, I think it just depends on where you're at in terms of um, your, again, even capacity to be able to implement some of these processes. Like ultimately there's a ton of tools that we'd love to have, right? But the question is one, are you in a place that to even make the best use out of it? So it goes back to my original comment on kind of the foundational data hygiene. Um, a lot, at least certain companies, depending on the stage, if you don't have that process, um, really uh, figure it out and key, you can't really put more tools on top of it, right? To get them any of those analytics or um, uh, and all the great stuff that you can get out of these tools. So one, you have to figure out where you're at. So that's what we look at, right? Where do we have to prioritize our investment to make sure that we can utilize these tools in the future? Um, and then um, it really also just depends on, again, timing of capacity, right? For us, like there's just multiple projects that we have to do. Um, and so for the time being, it's okay, certain processes are just gonna be done in Salesforce or the current tools that we have. And then what are we gonna add on when, um, when we're ready? So I think like for us, it really has to do with readiness. And then again, where we wanna focus um, the data on. So um, for us, um, I can see us going, once we have more of the data hygiene figured out, like foundational processes, we'll be looking to utilize that data more in some of more of the predictive tools, right? To give another viewpoint from just our, more of our own models, more of the roll up um, forecast to kind of have that AI predictive would be our next step once we get the data through that. <clears throat> yeah, I think the, it's, a, it's a good question. And I think uh, for me, uh, I, I think it ties more closely to what are the problems that um, you're trying to solve. And if, if you have an accurate forecast and you're using spreadsheets, uh, number one, that's, that's awesome. And I, I envy you very much. Um, but, but number two, you may not need any tooling. Um, and so I think it's, it's a bit of, uh, you know, complexity, where, where are you at from a forecasting uh, process? Where are you at from a scaling process? I mean, doing spreadsheets with uh, ease is, is probably pretty challenging. And so I, 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 would, I would say, I think, um, you know, the, likely the more, the, the, the larger you are, the, the easier it is to have a tool um, come in and, and help assist in a lot of this. And I think, you know, it, it gets back to uh, one of the points that Brandon, Brandon made, which is looking back at prior forecasts and saying, why were we off? 
and will a tool actually solve some of those gaps for us? So was it that we saw the insight, we just couldn't surface it to a sales leader to understand it. And so we're gonna plug in a tool so that sales leaders have those insights and can see it on a weekly basis. And, and we think that sort of solves the forecast gap that we had. I think that's how I would think about it, evaluating whether a tool is needed or not. Yeah, I, it, it's so interesting because it is it is such a spectrum and we do see companies big and small that want a tool. They believe it's going to really change their life, change their world. But to your point, if, if you can do it on a spreadsheet, that's fantastic. I think and I hope most companies realize that that's not um, a, a way to scale. So I definitely appreciate um, all the all the feedback and input here um, from all three of you. So thank you so much. Um, just a, a boost up the process you obviously need for your forecast accuracy. Um, we have a tool that enables you to run an accurate forecast processes. Um, you don't need a tool, you're right. If you can do it out of a spreadsheet, maybe the tooling isn't ready for you, but BoostUp does allow you to customize pretty much anything and everything you want when it comes to your forecast. Starting simple is super, super easy. Additionally, going into that really complex um, deal inclusion, exclusion, forecasting on different cadences is, is, is really big in BoostUp. Um, one thing that I would love to hear from the group, this is just thoughts around how to reduce the workload on your salespeople to your point, if they're not, um, if they're not out there selling and they're just forecasting, that's a, a big waste of their time. So I would love to hear from the team if there's anything they would add to this on how you can kind of reduce the load on both your sales reps and your sales managers when thinking about forecasting. Yes. I'll just comment and say, I think for, I think it's important to make sure you're differentiating between forecasting, right? And then also just data that the company wants, right? That comes out of forecasting or deals, right? And so for us, we're going through a transition where we're moving towards more of a SaaS cloud-based model, right? And so with that comes all different KPIs that, that everybody wants to track, or we're looking at different segments now and different go-to-market models. You want to cut and slice data. But I think what we started doing is uh, thinking through, okay, what data like do we need from sales management or sales leaders or sales teams? And what is the data that we need to figure out processes to extract ourselves just for metrics? And we could have gone down a path where we're like, okay, make make you know each sales leader make a call for all these different new logos versus um, existing, and then this segment versus this, and this product versus this. And we realized, no, you have to simplify their forecasting process. And then we're in charge of figuring out how to link all the data, the information and metrics to actually provide to all you know, the cross-functional leadership or for ourselves to manage the forecast. So I think it's just important to start really thinking through and focusing on what really is the forecasting inputs and what's on operations teams and data teams. And, you know, in conjunction with finance to make sure we can get the available data needed for certain metrics or just for even the forecast discussions, right? Yeah, that's a great point. It's not always on your sales team to be providing all of this data. There's a lot of other inputs for sure. I think that's a, I mean, I just want to like reemphasize that. I think that is literally one of our most important jobs in kind of this operational space is to act as that go between to kind of hold at bay those folks that want to see, you know, the data sliced and diced and forecast eight diff 800 different ways. That is our job to say, no, like we're going to have them forecast this one number and we'll go slice it, make some assumptions and do that. But it's really easy to just once again pass that down. So I think that's a really important piece to, um, for us to all make sure we're managing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, one, one of the things uh, as I look on the on the salespeople column, I think um, you know the the example that Brandon shared around uh, opportunities to have a closed date in the weekend. You know, I think uh, ideally if we can ask our salespeople to keep their pipeline, to me, that's the nirvana of forecasting for the salespeople because it's literally no extra time for them. It's, it's just keeping your pipeline clean and up to date. And if you do that, that's all that's needed for a sales manager. As long as the sales manager is having one-on-ones and, and deal, deal review, deal inspection, like a, a salesperson shouldn't have to actually spend time forecasting. And I, I know that's um, a lot of the time, but I, but ideally, like it's it's just the it, it's a it's a place that we can strive to get to, 
And um, maybe the maybe the the one point that I that I really like that I'm uh, I think we're trying to work on is providing a benefit back to the sales organization for having an accurate forecast. And I think demand that the business demands an accurate forecast, but no one actually is seeing uh, tangible benefits to that accurate forecast. Now, obviously, if you're a public company, there's you know stock prices and things like that that, that are impacted by it. But the, I think there's more that that certainly our team could do to provide benefit back to individual AEs or or sales leader that would help them uh, either with more insights or or better performance overall. Yeah, that's a great point. I immediately think of gamification and how much reps are, are competitive and love that. But there is a lot more benefit to having an accurate forecast and, and being able being able to let the sales reps know that. And I think that transparency piece and using transparency to drive the right behavior is always super, super important. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to our panel today. I really appreciate all the input, all the conversation. It's awesome. And I just wanted to remind the group that we've got next month our part three of our forecasting masterclass with uh, a couple other industry veterans. So again, thank you so much to our panel today. Um, if you guys want, go ahead and register for our July uh, forecasting masterclass, hopefully you're not on vacation. Um, but thank you again, really appreciate all the time and uh, feel free to check out Blue Step.